Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Nick Rushby, um, and I edit the British Journal of Educational Technology, which is one of a, a clutch of journals um, that's um, owned, operated um, by Vera, whose conference we're, we're at today. The roots of this seminar um, come from a discussion that a number of the members of editorial board were having. Um, started about 18 months ago uh, when we found that we were getting a flood of papers um, from um, specifically a number of identifiable countries um, which were presenting us with a lot of problems. Um, they were presenting us with, with problems partly because of their quality. Um, I won't dwell on, on that. Um, but also because of their interpretation of what sorts of things were within scope um, of a, a journal which styles itself as a journal of educational technology. Um, and this led us on, I mean, one of the first things we had to do was to find out ways of dealing with this flood because, um, believe it or not, um, if you get a very large number of submissions um, that are um, not very publishable in an academic journal, um, it's quite a big problem. It, it costs you a lot of money to sort it out. But it led us on to a discussion of, well, what do we mean by educational technology anyway? You know, British Journal of Educational Technology. Um, what, what should our scope really look like? And that discussion's been rumbling on um, for uh, at least um, the last year, 18, uh, 15 months. And then the opportunity came up here at this conference um, to get a group of people together and talk about it. Um, the agenda for today, um, I'm going to start off. Um, Colin Latcham is our corresponding editor for Asia Pacific. Um, Colin, unfortunately, can't be with us today. Um, he's, uh, how do you describe it, um, Elizabeth? He's from the West. He's, he's in Perth, Western Australia. Um, so we've got a video of him um, instead. Um, not nearly as good as the real thing. He's a very entertaining speaker. Um, but, you know, hey, we're just going to make do. Um, Diana Lorillard, a number of you will know, um, used to be um, at the Open University, then moved, what was it DFES when you were there? DFES. DFES. Um, and looked after um, the um, department's um, attempts to put together a strategy for computers and education. I, looking back down, I gave you a really hard time about that, didn't I? <laughs> That's what you were meant to do. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we seem to have kissed and made up since then, so we're, we're still talking to each other. And we're going to finish off with, uh, with Jill. Um, from the University of Greenwich. Um, and these are different views as to what we think might constitute educational technology. We're all aiming to keep those relatively short um, so that there is the maximum amount of time um, to get your views um, about this. Um, the aim of the project is very ambitious. Um, I, I quite like ambitious um, objectives for, for projects, particularly if I don't think at the beginning that I'm ever going to get there. Do you remember what Stephen was talking about yesterday? You know, if you're, if you're not taking risks, if you're not aiming too high, you're failing. So um, I don't actually expect, certainly not today, to get to um, the, the end of this process. If we can make a start, that's absolutely great. In the short term, there are various things about the scope of the journal. I mean, you know, we're focusing this, grounding this um, in, in the journal. Um, it's a journal that titles itself Educational Technology. Um, it has a published scope. We'll talk, about, talk more about that in a moment. Um, it has a published scope. Is that scope right? Does it meet the, the current requirements? Um, what's important these days in educational technology? And this is a, a very simple model. You could make it 
far more complex if you wanted, um, but it, it's a start. In a sense, a field is defined or could be considered to be defined by what's published. Okay, so that was my starting point. But journals are at the mercy of authors. We can only publish stuff that um, is submitted. Now, we can influence it a bit. We can ask people to write papers for us. That's a really interesting bit of, um, of um, work you're doing. Why don't you write about it for us? Um, but if people don't write about something, if nobody writes about the psychology of communication and submits it to the journal, I can't publish it. What research is being carried out, again, is subject, um, depends on a number of other things. You can't do any research work unless somebody pays you for it. Not unless you're very lucky and you've got private means. And I'm probably the only person in the room who can actually just decide, because I, I also run a consulting company, who can actually decide what he wants to do some research on. Because I can then make the decision that I'm going to use some money from the company to do it. But pretty much we're constrained by what the funding agencies, what, the, what um, the current research agenda is. So it's not quite as straightforward as it might seem. Um, and I do have to say, although I try not to let it show, I try not to do it, um, as do my colleagues in the editorial team. Um, there is a thing about editorial preference. Whether you like it or not, um, you know, if the editors have got um, a particular bee in their bonnet, you've got to be very strong-willed not to let that influence what gets published. And it would be dishonest to suppose that that didn't happen. I'd like to think it doesn't happen too much with BJET, but, you know, it's there. It's there as an influence. So that might be a way of looking at what is educational technology at the moment. Um, the British Journal of Educational Technology. Um, well, it's not that British, actually. Uh, something like 10% of all submissions um, and about 10% of the published papers come from the United Kingdom. The rest of it is international. Um, but you don't change the name of a journal, not lightly. Ask Becky about it sometime. Um, Becky's the person at Wiley who looks after BJET. Um, it causes all sorts of problems. And I've, I've known journals which have fallen apart because they've changed their name. And in some respects, and this is where an editorial preference comes in, you could argue that it really should be a journal of educational training technology. Because I do have a preference I've, I've, you know, I've got a, a liking for training and, and trainers writing stuff that I can put in the journal. They don't very often. Trainers don't have time to write, unfortunately. Um, quite a lot of them don't have the, uh, the, the experience to put together an academic paper that will stand up to peer review. But we ought to think about training. Maybe that takes us into, um, well, perhaps it ought to be learning technology, not educational technology. That's part of the debate. Um, I'm not normally into definitions. I, I don't like, as a matter of course, um, starting off a presentation by saying, well, I looked up Wikipedia, or I looked up, and, you know, this is, this is the definition of it. But in this case, I think it's appropriate. We are trying to redefine the field. Or at any rate, if we're not redefining it, confirm that our definition is what we would like it to be. And there are a couple of, uh, of definitions. Um, they're not too far apart. I mean, there are nuances between them. Um, one of the, the big concerns, I think, that I have personally, is whether educational technology is getting too defined by ICT, that we're so concerned about the gadgets that we use, that we think of those as educational technology, rather than the broader picture. 
discuss. Now, that's quite interesting. We're in the 43rd volume of BJET. Started out with a slightly different title um, in 1970, which just about predates Diana and myself. Um, and if you look at what that said, and you compare it with today's scope statement, it's not actually so different. Do you need a moment or two more to read it? Or? Everybody, everybody's into speed reading off the screen. Yeah, okay. Now, if you're, if you're a member of the reviewer panel or the editorial board, um, or if you have authored a paper, where's, where's Linda? If you've author, ever authored a paper um, for BJET, you will have had, or you should have had, um, unless you change your email, um, a survey from me about a month ago. Um, short survey, and it was in preparation for this. One of the questions was whether we think there is a difference between educational technology and learning technology. Interesting. Not quite a, um, a third and two thirds, but there is a, a definite feeling that educational technology and learning technology are somehow, you know, we mean different things by them. We don't have time today, unfortunately, to try and unpack that. Um, I've got pages and pages. We've got some people wrote essays on it. There was a, a space in the survey. Um, and they emailed me separately about it because there wasn't enough room in the, the box that I'd given them. Um, so there's quite a lot there. And you know, we, just, we just don't have time to go through that immediately. Um, what I do want to do quickly is go through um, the various scope statements, because I also ask people um, on the, the scope statements um, how they thought these re related to their, their practice and their understanding. It's a reasonable size sample. 575 people responded to this. Um, but it is a very selective sample. It's the people who've written for BJET and the people who review from BJET. I think what will be interesting in the months to come is to send this out more widely, for example, to IT Forum, and see whether the people who haven't written for BJET have a similar perception. Or maybe, you know, sort of send, see whether I can get AECT to do it for their membership or, or something like that. And just go through very quickly, ICT, I've, I've, I've roughly ranked these um, so that the, the statements at the, um, at the beginning of this sequence are where people thought, you know, these were, these were the most important, these were core. 70% um, um, of people felt that ICT in education and training was core to their understanding. Potential and problems of new technologies, a little bit less. Monitoring and evaluating learning a bit. Assessment methods, well, I was quite pleased to see it was there, but, you know, we're getting down to, to things which people aren't rating so highly. Colin was very pleased about open and distance learning systems. That's his bag. Um, you know, remember, he's, he's Australia. Um, and does things like works with the Commonwealth of Learning and, and so on. Um, quality assurance, design production, it's less. Support for self-study, storage retrieval. I don't know about you, I'm really disappointed about the psychology of communication. Yeah? I would have thought that was really important. But what you have to remember with all this lot um, is that it, this, this project is being driven by people who've, who've spent a long time in educational technology. And it's quite possible that we're very reactionary about this. We would like things to be as they were in the 1970s and the 1980s. 
whereas the field may have moved on. And it may be that actually we do need to redefine educational technology. That things like the psychology of communication, it's really a different discipline these days. And, you know, let's, let's stick it together with, with cognitive neuroscience and, and, if necessary, we'll set up a new journal. But, you know, that's what today is all about.